Hello everyone. In this presentation, I'm going to talk about the relation between spam programs and the time complexity of quantum algorithms. Before we start, I would like to thank the organizers of MFCS for featuring this presentation on their YouTube channel. I would also like to point out that this research was a collaborative effort between myself, Stacy Jeffrey, Maris Ozels, and Alvaro Pietrafita. The structure of this talk will be relatively straightforward. First, I will explain how you can turn span programs into quantum algorithms. And after that, I will explain how you can turn quantum algorithms into span programs. Finally, I will demonstrate how you can use these techniques to solve the variable time search problem. I'll start by explaining what span programs are. Informally, we can think of a span program as an encoding of a Boolean function into the geometry of a Hilbert space. But let's make that more concrete. To that end, let f be a Boolean function that takes n bits as input. If we want to encode this Boolean function into the geometry of a Hilbert space, then we need to define four mathematical objects. First, we define the Hilbert space itself, which we call h. And to every element x in the domain of f, we associate a subspace of h, which we call h of x. On the right, we show a visualization of this, where the big blob represents the Hilbert space H, and the red lines represent the subspaces associated to the different elements in the domain of F. Second, we define the target space, which we call V. This can be any vector space without additional structure. Third, we define a target vector, which we call tau. This can be any vector in the target space. And finally, we define a linear operator A, which maps the Hilbert space H into the vector space V. This we refer to as the spam program operator. Formally, a spam program is nothing more than a tuple of these four objects. Now we can ask the following question. Given some element in the domain of F, can we find a vector in its associated subspace H of X? that by A gets mapped to the target vector. In other words, given some element in the domain of F, can we reach the target vector from its associated subspace H of X? If this is the case, then we say that X is a positive instance. And if this is not the case, then we say that X is a negative instance. We say that the spam program P evaluates a Boolean function f, if f of x being 1 is equivalent to saying that x is a positive instance. So in this way, we can see that indeed we have encoded f into the geometry of our Hilbert space, because f of x equaling 1 is now exactly the same as saying that there exists a vector in the subspace h of x that gets mapped to the target vector tau. Now, you might ask, why is this a sensible thing to do? Why do these definitions make sense? Well, the answer is that this particular way of encoding a Boolean function f into the geometry of a Hilbert space H allows for the construction of a quantum algorithm that evaluates this function f. Let's have a more in-depth view on how this works. To that end, we start off with the visualization that we had from our previous slide. The first observation that we make is that the kernel of A is the subspace of H and hence can be drawn in much the same way as we also drew the subspace H of X. Next, we define the set W, which is the set of the, all the vectors in H that are being mapped to the target vector tau. We can see that this set W is an affine subspace of H which runs parallel to the kernel of A. The smallest vector in W we call W0. We can see that this vector W0 is in the orthogonal complement of the kernel of A. On the one hand, it could be that this set W and the space H of X have a non-empty intersection. If this is the case, then any vector in this intersection 
is both an element of h of x and is being mapped to the target vector tau. Such a vector we call a positive witness, because this is exactly the vector that we required for x to be a positive instance of the spam program. From our visualization, we now see that if we are dealing with a positive instance, then w0 is a linear combination of a vector in h of x and a vector in the kernel of a. On the other hand, it could be that w and h of x do not intersect. This is shown on the right, where we can see that this affine subspace w hovers above the ground plane that is being spanned by the kernel of a and h of x. And hence, we can see that w does not intersect h of x. If this is the case, then we can find a vector omega x, which is orthogonal to both h of x and the kernel of a, and whose inner product with w0 is 1. In the visualization, this vector omega x is pointing straight up. Such a vector only exists whenever f of x is 0, and hence we refer to such a vector as a negative witness. Now, let's do a little thought experiment. Suppose that we start with the vector w0, and that we apply the following operations to it. First, we reflect through the space h of x, and then we reflect through the kernel of a. If we are dealing with a positive instance, then we can see what happens to the vector w0 in the visualization on the left. We can see that the vector w0 will start to rotate around the origin over an angle of 2 theta, where theta is the angle between the spaces kernel of a and h of x. On the other hand, if we are dealing with a negative instance, then we can see what happens to the vector w0 in the visualization on the right. Here we can see that w0 will start to act more like a gyroscope, which is another way of saying that its horizontal component will start to rotate around the origin, but its vertical component will stay in the same location. In short, we can see that if we are dealing with a positive instance, the entire vector w0 will start to rotate, whereas if we are dealing with a negative instance, a part of the vector w0 will stay the same and will be left unaltered. It is this phenomenon that a quantum algorithm can detect, and hence we can use this to construct a quantum algorithm that computes the function f. This algorithm we refer to as the spam program algorithm. The next question that we face is how costly it is to implement this spam program algorithm. It turns out that the length of the witnesses we just defined plays a crucial role in the analysis of the spam program algorithm. Let's dig a little bit deeper into that. First of all, for every positive instance, we have to find a positive witness. And we let w plus be the maximum of the, all the norm squares of all these positive witnesses. Similarly, we have to find negative witnesses to all of the negative instances. And we define w minus as the maximal norm squared of all of these negative witnesses. Next, we also have to supply four subroutines to the spam program algorithm. We need to supply it with a, a subroutine that reflects through the kernel of A. We need to supply it with a subroutine that reflects through H of X. We also need to supply it with a subroutine that constructs the state W0 from some reference state Ket0. And we also need to be able to reflect through this reference state Ket0. Now we can express the total cost of our spam program algorithm in terms of the number of calls to these subroutines and the number of extra gates that we would have to perform. It turns out that the number of calls that we have to make to all of these subroutines is equal to the square root of w plus times w minus up to constant factors. And we also see that the number of extra gates that we need in our construction is negligible towards this number. We have now seen a rough sketch on how we can take a spam program and turn that into a quantum algorithm. This construction was invented by Reichardt in his 
paper in 2009. In the same paper, he observed that the converse is possible as well. Namely, we can take a quantum algorithm and turn that into a spam program too. So this makes the following construction possible. We can take any particular quantum algorithm A, turn it into a spam program, and then turn it back into a quantum algorithm B. Reichert showed that this is possible without incurring too much overhead into the query complexity. Specifically, he proved that the query complexity of the new quantum algorithm B is only a constant factor worse than the query complexity of the quantum algorithm A. This is interesting in its own right because it proves that for every Boolean function f, there exists a spam program that generates a quantum algorithm that evaluates f with optimal query complexity. The immediate question that arises is whether a similar result can be obtained with respect to the time complexity. This is the question that we set out to solve, and in this work, we solve it in the affirmative case for a particular class of quantum algorithms. Specifically, we show that if our quantum algorithm A allows for what we call efficient uniform access, then we can go through this construction whilst only incurring a polylogarithmic factor in the time complexity. I will get to what it means for an algorithm to allow for efficient uniform access in due course. Now, let's take a closer look at how we can take a quantum algorithm and turn that into a spam program. The first thing we need to do is we need to make a couple of assumptions on our quantum algorithm. In our paper, we go at length to prove that these assumptions are all without loss of generality. We assume that our quantum algorithm can be chopped up into capital T time steps, and in each time step, either a query is being performed to the input, which is represented by the red boxes showing O of X, or an input independent operation is applied. We also assume that the algorithm starts out in the all zero state and that it computes the function value f of x in the last qubit while setting all the other qubits back to zero. We also denote the state throughout the execution of the algorithm by psi zero of x, psi one of x, psi two of x, etc. In order to turn this algorithm into a spam program, we need to define the four mathematical objects that comprise a spam program, namely the Hilbert space H, the target space V, the target vector tau, and the spam program operator A. Note that our quantum algorithm already acts on a Hilbert space, which consists of two registers, namely the index register and the workspace register. In our construction, we add an extra register which we call the time register, and it is capable of holding the time steps 0, 1, 2, all the way up to t. This combined Hilbert space, so the tensor product between the time register, the index register, and the workspace register, we use for both the Hilbert space H and the target space V. Now, the target vector, tau, that we define, is the all zero state, the initial state of our algorithm, at time step zero, minus the uh, state that signifies success, so the zero, 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 001 state, at time step t. Furthermore, we define the spam program operator A to take a state t psi and map it to the difference between t psi and whatever psi would be mapped to by the t plus first time step at time step t plus one. The core idea now is that if we take a summation of all the states that our algorithm visits throughout its execution, and we plug that into the spam program operator A, then this produces a telescoping sum, which exactly arrives at the target vector if and only if f of x equals one. The idea is now that this summation constitutes the positive witnesses for the positive instances. Using this idea and a bunch of other technical details, we managed to show that our spam program 
uh, has positive and negative witness sizes both linear in the query complexity. That means that uh, the resulting square root of w plus times w minus also scales linearly in the query complexity. Next, observe that this quantity, square root w plus w minus, is exactly the number of calls that the spam program algorithm makes to the four subroutines it's being given access to. So, in order to figure out how costly it is to implement the spam program algorithm, it remains to figure out how costly it is to implement these subroutines. But in order to implement these subroutines, we need to have access to the original algorithm through some oracles. We will make use of three oracles, namely the oracle OX, the oracle OA, and the oracle OQ. The oracle OX simply is the oracle that the original algorithm also has access to. This is the oracle that queries individual bits of the bit string of the function f that is being computed. Next, the oracle OA can, given uh, some time step t, apply the teeth unitary that the original algorithm applies. And the oracle OQ is capable of telling us whether a given time step t is a query time step or not. Using these oracles, we have supplied particular implementations of these four subroutines, and their costs are listed in this table. What we can see in the bottom row is the total cost of implementing the spam program algorithm. What we can see here is that the query complexity does not suffer from any significant overhead. Similarly, we can see that the number of calls to OA and OQ are only linear in the number of time steps. So, if we can implement these oracles OA and OQ with only a number of gates that scales polylogarithmically in the number of time steps, then the entire construction does not incur significant overhead in the resulting time complexity. That's why this property, namely the ability to implement these oracles OA and OQ with only a polylogarithmic number of gates, this we refer to as efficient uniform access. It is a reasonable question to ask now what algorithms possess this property of allowing for efficient uniform access. We have been able to show that many deep algorithms with succinct description satisfy this property. And most notably, Grover's algorithm and many of its derivatives fall in this class. However, it is an interesting question in its own right and is still subject to further research. Finally, I will elaborate a little bit on how we can use these techniques to solve the variable time search problem. In the variable time search problem, we are given n algorithms that all compute a single bit. And we want to, ask, to answer the question whether there is at least one algorithm that outputs one. What we, we can now do is we can take these n original algorithms turn each of them into a spam program, and then merge these spam programs into one spam program using a construction called the OR spam program, which was come up with by Reichardt in 2009. The resulting spam program we can turn back into a quantum algorithm, and this algorithm will now compute whether there exists at least one algorithm that outputs a one. We can now analyze the cost of this new quantum algorithm, B we find that the query complexity of this algorithm is the squared average of the query complexity of all the original algorithms. Similarly, the number of calls to OA and OQ is the squared average of the time complexity of all of the original algorithms. It was already known that both of these algorithms could be obtained, but it was not known that both of these complexities could be obtained simultaneously. Moreover, we provide a new analysis that counts the number of extra gates that are introduced throughout this construction. This number of extra gates turns out to be the squared average of the time complexities of all of the original algorithms as well, and this is a new result. With that, we have reached the end of this presentation. We have investigated how you can take a quantum algorithm, turn that into a spam program, and turn it back into a quantum algorithm again. We already knew that when one can do this, 
without incurring significant overhead in the query complexity of the quantum algorithm. But we have showed that if our original algorithm allows for efficient uniform access, we can also do this without incurring significant overhead in the time complexity. After that, we showed how these techniques can be used to solve the variable time search problem. We can derive a couple of interesting directions for further research from this work. First, it would be nice if we could provide characterizations of algorithms that allow for efficient uniform access, preferably those that can be efficiently checked. And finally, it would be nice if we could modify our construction to solve the variable time search problem to solve the variable time threshold problem instead. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention. I will be available at the Q&A session to answer any questions you might have, but you can also always reach out to me or any of my co-authors via email. Goodbye.